I think the past little while worldwide has proved that no matter how big of a company you work for, stability is relative. What's up? My name is Devin. This is The Perspective. I'm here with my co-host, Mitch Harley, uh, and we are talking about um, a number of things. One of those being why uh, only 15% of people uh, filed as self-employed on their tax returns this last year. And I, I think that number is is like astounding. I thought I thought like in my head, I had it that there was so much more competition. There were so many more people out there running their own businesses. And to hear that it's only 15% is... I, I've dug into it because when I saw that statistic, I was like, what does that tell me? What do we use that information for? And I'm like, at first it was like, well, 15% of people in Canada, that's a lot. And But if you take out of that, there's there's people that claim self-employment, but they do work for an employee. They just invoice them so that they can have those you know benefits of a... Of a business. Right, so the, you, con- the minus, contractors. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. your consultants or whatever, and you know, I've been down that road too. You minus that off of that. So let's say that's five percent because there's a lot of trades and things like that that are are kind of that. So out of that ten percent, then you still have guys that are self-employed, but maybe just individual because they're trades, say roofers, electricians, drywallers. You know, it's not really they're employing much. They've got their contracts with their builders. So that's a percentage out of that ten percent. So now. Let's just say that's 2% for, for argument's sake. Now we're down to 8% of people in Canada that claim self-employed. 8%. Well, that changes things now. Uh, I got to I gotta do the math on this really quickly because I'm pretty sure that that number is so small. So what is there? 34 million people in Canada, yeah? Yeah, something like that. So... At that eight percent, that leaves about uh, just a little over two and a half million people. So two million people claiming self-employed. Yeah, doesn't seem like much, but if they were all in one place, they what would that be? What's Vancouver? Four million. Right, that like even the city of Calgary is one point four million. Yeah, so you'd have Calgary and surrounding area I'd probably hit two million. Yeah, so that means that the rest of Canada, all of Ontario, the GTA, that all of BC with Vancouver in it. I mean, those are kind of your major population areas for Canada. That means not one single person in there would be self-employed or an entrepreneur or have their own business. Which is, I don't know, man, it's scary to me because when I, when I think about the way that I was raised and the environment that I grew up in, both my parents were entrepreneurs and both of them like essentially just did whatever it takes. You know what I mean? Like I I remember hearing stories when my dad moved here from Ontario. Uh, He lived in a small town on a farm and um, ventured out here for work. And for the first month that he was here, literally him and his best friend lived in a tent and uh, panhandled to get by while they looked for jobs, found a job. And then, my dad slowly worked and this was long before I was born, but he slowly worked himself into a position to afford, um, a a college education. He became a, um, a computer engineer and then got a job working for a company who was contracted by the government to, you know, maintain hospital equipment and and things that, uh, was just a little outside of the scope of everyday regular stuff. But even back then the connotation of being like a businessman was like, it wasn't cool. It wasn't fun. It wasn't entertaining. It wasn't interesting. But like me as a child watching my dad, just like do whatever he wanted, (laughs) which is literally the world that I grew up in. My dad just did whatever he wanted. So he was really good at his job, which allowed him the freedom to go and, you know, uh, explore other ideas and options while, you know, maintaining some level of security. He, you know, he had a predictable paycheck that was coming in. I think that might be, you know, one of the things that, um, the not self-employed demographic of our, of our, uh, you know, world 
that's the thing that they're um, afraid of is not having that predictability. Mind you, after 20 something years of him working at that company, they lost their main contract and closed down everything that they were working on in Western Canada, which meant that he was out of job and left with a, you know, a measly pension and to fend for himself. But even in those moments, like I don't ever remember my dad being like, oh, it's the end of the world. Uh, he just, you know, did whatever it took. He started a private investigation company. He uh, worked with U-Haul. You know, U-Haul gives you like, um, there's like an independent distributorship where you can rent out U-Hauls as long as you got the space to keep them and you earn a commission on the U-Hauls that you rent. So he did that. He got his car dealership license and started selling cars and just like whatever it took, he invested in real estate. He invested in stock market and a bunch of other things, but, but just like that, that freedom. So as an example, for me growing up, it was like, yeah, you can do whatever you want, but I don't imagine that that's how other people grew up and, you know, had their experience as a, as a, as a child. I, I wonder like, what was, what was it like for you kind of growing up in, into the system? I kind of had a mix because my dad, my dad's a mechanic. So he worked for a shop. He worked for dealerships. So it was a very nine to five Monday to Friday job. And, and that was fine for us. But, you know, we also did things that projects that would make us money. We subdivided, moved a farmhouse, renovated it, lots of things like that. We always did things ourselves. So it wasn't really a stretch for me to go into the trades and then start working for myself at, at some point. But what I learned was I am, I am very supportive of anybody who wants to work for themselves. I think somebody who wants to work for themselves, become independent in whatever field they want, I think should. And, and even if you have that fear of instability, it, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to create an income for yourself. I think the past little while worldwide has proved that no matter how big of a company you work for, stability is relative, right? You look at a company like Air Canada, well, what happened? Well, government made some calls, changes made very rapidly. How many people lost their job with a company that should have been so stable with profits coming from places nobody knew about and, you know, record numbers, millions and, and billions of profit on quarters. And then they can't handle themselves for a couple months. And they cut everyone loose. And, you know, so I think people have to put it in, in perspective of what is stable. But at the same time, I also feel that there's, and I live by this, that there's two groups of people, there's leaders and there's followers. And it's not a bad thing to be either one. If you're a follower, that doesn't mean you're a weak person. It doesn't mean you can't own a company, but it means you can't, you're not comfortable setting your own goals. And so that you need someone else to set those goals for you and help you get there. Even if you're owning your own business, that means you need someone to kind of coach you along. You need someone to lead you because you're just, you're a follower personality. And if you're a leader, that also puts a responsibility on you because that means you most of the time can't work with other people or can't be told what to do. You're very independent. And so you do well working. Yeah, and you do well working for yourself. That's completely fine, but that doesn't give you, you know, the right to be mean or it doesn't give you the right to um, attack other people because you have a strong personality. And what I found, especially in the trades world, there were two kinds of people there between your leaders and followers. There were tradespeople that had a business and there was businessmen with a trades company. Mm. And in the roofing world, especially you would have guys that have roofed for years. They're really good at roofing, but they're crappy at running a business. They don't understand sales. They tell the customer what they want. They're just, they have no bedside manner, no qualities, no professionalism. And you give them, you, you try to show them something, how to improve their business, whether it be from marketing, sales, product, whatever it is. I've been doing this for 20 years. I don't need that. It's like, no, you've been roofing for 20 years. You're running a business. You haven't even started. Whereas you talk to somebody who runs a business with a trades company, they could go sell socks and they'd still be successful. They just do it because they're comfortable running wire, hanging drywall or siding, landscaping. So you know, there's a there's level of like personal interpersonal skills that, that happens there that some people just don't get like, like for, for you in your world, um, 
of sales, uh, having that, that, those channels of communication to be able to like reach people, have the right conversations, elevate those conversations in constructive ways. Some people are really good at that. And some people just don't have that skill yet. And it's not to say they can't get it, but being stuck behind that barrier that you create for yourself and not allowing yourself to like explore that is um, is just limiting to the potential of you being able to serve people to a higher capacity. But if you, if you're coachable and you're able to take direction, you can overcome that because a lot of people that let's just say are terrible at sales doesn't, they might be really nice people, but they just can't for the life of them sell whatever they're selling. Mm. Part of it is maybe they don't believe in their selling, but let's say they believe in their product. Why can't they sell? Because nobody's showing them that there are basic tactics, there are basic scenarios that you can improve and you can connect with people. You know, in the in the sales drive course, that whole thing on upsell and, and you know add-on sales, that's that's a concept that a salesperson has to adapt to whether you own the business and you're doing the sales yourself or whether you employ a sales team, you have to show them that there is value to adding on to the sale, to giving the customer more than maybe what they thought they needed initially. Because right. well-chosen well, add-on sales will increase your revenue. It'll increase your productivity and it'll increase your customer retention because they're happy with what they've walked away from. They don't feel like they bought something that maybe was overpriced or something they didn't need. Well, and think of, I think of it in terms of like, listen, if right now we're, it's normal that you buy a car and it comes with four wheels, but let's just say as an example, a car that you purchased didn't come with four wheels for like, also, uh, when you go to McDonald's, you buy a Big Mac, Big Mac doesn't have fries attached to it. If you want the fries, you know, they're there. And if somebody didn't tell you that they were there, you wouldn't know that they were there. So you're just buying this Big Mac and, and you're stuck with that. So the same thing exists with the cars. Like, okay, cool. You can have a car. There's a stereo system and it. it's really nice, comfy chairs. The, the seats are heated, air conditioning when it's hot outside. And this is a really nice environment, but you can't go anywhere with it. You know, it would really help if you wanted to go places is if you had some wheels. Do you want those also? And that's the, the frame of mind that people miss when they come into that is like, oh, I, I think I'm tricking people into shit or, or maybe I'm, uh, you know, overselling or, or whatever it may be. And it's like, no, maybe that person didn't even know that they needed the thing that you're showing them because nobody's ever showed them that thing. And so it becomes really, really powerful when you take that frame of mind of, listen, I'm just here to help. And I'm going to give you this, 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 and, and that's, you know, what you asked for. Did you know these other things existed? And if you didn't, well, here they are. And this is why they're valuable. This is how they're going to change you or change your experience with this thing. Because I know for myself, having a car without four wheels changes the experience completely for me. Yeah. Right. But there's a difference between selling someone they don't, something they don't need. Which is sleazy and slimy and, and very bad. Right. But if you educate, let's, let's use the car business for, cause they're very good at add on sales. It's design, the whole car industry is based on add on sales. If someone was to walk out of that dealership with the bare bones car, no AC hand crank windows, like old school vehicle, they might be really My happy. With their, yeah. They, they might be really happy with what they're paying per month, but a couple months down the road, they're going to regret. And then they're going to see someone with a similar car with an extra $5 payment that has power windows. And they're like, I didn't know you could get power windows. Why, why did I not get that offer? And then they're mad at you. And then they're mad at telling you saving yeah. the money. Right. And it's like, I would have, I saw value in power windows. I would have paid that, you know, extra hundred dollar add on for that. And so that's a very simple way of, of looking at it. But then on the other hand, you have a car that's fully loaded. The payments are max maybe even beyond what the person can bear and you got the salesperson that's just that's the car everyone needs and tries pushing it well now you have a bunch of people with really luxury cars but they can't afford it they're uncomfortable they're stressed month to month because of this car is that a good add-on sale no because that's not putting your customer in that's not someone that's going to come back to you to buy it's very short-sighted so there's that there's that in between right you have to, you have to learn from a sales perspective how do I retain customers? How do I get return business? And how do I make each one of them walk away with a custom purchase that meets their needs 
and maximizes my revenue. Right. And That's I think that. that it's super important too, because when, when you decide to go into business for yourself, and even though there's a small amount of people that make that decision, they've made that decision based on the information that they have. And the information they have is like, oh, well, working at this place is more beneficial because you have security, you have benefits, you don't have to worry about your taxes, you get a return at the end of the year. There's, Sure, there's a lot of these benefits, but then on the, on the flip side, there's a lack of information and education when it comes to, okay, well, when you start your own business, you get to set your own schedule. You can work whenever you work. You can help people the way that you want to help people. Um, you, your income amount is unlimited. Uh, the, the tax benefits that you get as a result of you creating opportunities for other people are, are immense. There's so, so many more opportunities that come from that. And so um, I think there's a lack of connection there with how our education system or how, you know, like the public education system is, is like uh, teaching and training people about the potential and, and opportunities they had. I remember having a conversation with my girlfriend's uh, son, he's about 12 years old, somewhere around that range. And you know, you know, the question, the age old question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Which I'm still trying to figure out. I'm 34. <laughs> I know what um, I want to be because I haven't grown up yet. So. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get there when we get there. Right. But we asked him and he, the answer that he said was so profound, man. It blew my mind. He goes, I don't know what all the jobs are. That's awesome. Isn't that a problem? There's a problem there. Why, why doesn't he know what all the jobs are? Are we wasting his time trying to teach him, you know, long form algorithmic division? Maybe he doesn't need that. I don't need that. I've never needed that in my entire life. I still have no application for Soka Toa. I uh, honestly, I don't know why I, I learned that. Yeah. It, it would have helped if I would have learned the potential and possibilities of the things that I know I'm good at. I'm a very creative person. I, I love being social. I love communicating. I love, um, you know, helping people. And when you put all those things together, it, it just made sense to have a marketing firm because you get to be creative. You get to help a business flourish, somebody create and build something out of scratch. And that's, um, that's amazing. But I didn't know that existed. You know what my options were? You could go into shop and learn how to build things or weld things. You could go into home ec and learn how to sew and cook, or you could take drama class. <laughs> this was it. And none of those things like suited it. The education center is a structure built on people that are not entrepreneurs. Right. They're people that jumped into a structured system and they're teaching. Now, I'm not saying everyone of the business should go start teaching our children. That, that, that brings up a list of problems as well. But you see where that culture is almost hindered for people that are creative, people that are willing to take those you know, minimal risks in order to build something for themselves. When I was in school, I was did this personality test and it said, you know, here's a list of jobs that fit your personality. You know what my jobs were? Taxi oh, driver, yeah. crane operator. What? Yeah, I'm telling you, I've owned three companies. I've worked for myself for years. I'm expanding, I'm building new businesses, I'm coaching others. But school told me that my one of my top three jobs was a crane operator and a taxi driver. That is the problem. What a huge disservice to the world it would have been to not have you do what you do now and have you stuck in a crane. Nothing against crane operators because no. they're necessary. We need them. But, but to be pigeonholed but like that. To, yeah, to be stuck in a box that you didn't fit in and told that that's you know, your only potential in the future at a time when you don't even you're, you don't even have the cognitive awareness to be able to develop the thought process, let alone you know, what it takes to actually like start your own thing or do your own thing, which is what I love about exploring other cultures. Something that I've made a habit of anytime I meet somebody that's kind of outside of my world, um, I get really, really curious. And it, and it comes from a genuine place of me just like, I want to understand how other people see the world, because maybe the way that I see the world isn't the way the world is. I've been wrong before. And, you know, as much as I hate being wrong, I love finding out new things and learning new things. And I love the idea that, um, you know, a family in a different country with not as much opportunity can come here and turn their ideas into opportunity or work towards creating something amazing for themselves and their communities and the people uh, that they love and care about friends and family and things like that. And, you know, we started, um, 
before this podcast, we kind of were like touching on, you know, what that's like and how, unless you are shown this information, you wouldn't even know it existed. And I, I think it's really powerful that, uh, you know, people like you and I who are in a position to educate or to communicate with people have the opportunity to uh, bring communities together around these ideas that, you know, it is possible to go and live a life worth living and pursue something that gives you purpose and have, you know, the, the dream come true. You know, you and me were talking about getting pigeonholed in school. People who've moved here from another country, they get pigeonholed too. Mm-hmm. They don't get pigeonholed to grade five, but they get pigeonholed because of their background, their language barrier. And, you know, the, most people don't want to admit it. And it can be taken out of context <laughs> at, at times and used as a veil to pursue another agenda. But plain and simple is they are pigeonholed. You look at the majority of workforces out there that use foreign workers. They're using them because they're cheap. And and the reality is they're working for a reason. They're working hard. They're willing to take those low income jobs to reach certain goals and aspirations. And they have skills like you know, we, we think we have skills. We think we have education here. If you talk to somebody who comes from Europe and has a, a background in carpentry or craftsman, like their work makes us look ridiculous. Yeah. But they're pigeonholed because they have an accent or, right. you know, they're, they're, their culture is different. They eat different food. You look at people that come from the Philippines. You know, there's a huge Filipino workforce that... You know, you, you see it a lot, fast food restaurants, they, they utilize them. But what, what I've always appreciated about that culture is they know what it's like not to have work. Right. They know what it's like to have to try to fulfill their family's needs on no income. So they come here. Yeah, maybe they take jobs that the average person here doesn't want, but they appreciate it. They work hard. They're reliable. They show up to work. I, I've worked with lots of them. When I was in the fast food industry, man, they were more reliable. They actually made more money than most of the local people because they showed up to their shifts and they covered for the ones that the white guys didn't show up to. It's crazy. The level of entitlement that our culture has created around what it means to have opportunity. Yeah. I want that opportunity, but I don't actually want that opportunity. I just don't want somebody else to take it from me. That's exactly what Not it that, was. That, that's yeah. my personal opinion, but I feel like there's a lot of that narrative happening no, in our right. current culture. You're right. There was people that would come and say, I can't believe you're hiring those people. You're taking away our jobs. And, and they would say that blatantly. And so I turned around and said, I did offer you that job and you turned it down. Yeah. So go back and sit on your couch. And, when you're and running a franchise and your profit margins, 12% on every dollar that you earn, of course you want people that that are going to fit inside of the way that that franchise works and you're limited. There's rules to the way that that franchise works. When you sign that contract and spend your quarter of a million dollars to even have access to that, you have to follow a very strict guideline. And that guideline outlines that this is all you can afford in order to keep things at these prices and have, and be competitive in the market, especially when you're selling burgers at a 24 cent markup. It's really difficult to run a business like that. Something else to consider. So taking us back to the entrepreneur and self-starter conversation, if especially if you are entering an industry, um, let's say you're doing a a clothing brand or you're doing something local with with an actual consumer product, more so than a service, there is a battle you have to fight, but it's worth fighting. And that is price. Because anyone can go to Walmart or whatever, I'm not picking on Walmart, but they can go to a, you know, a big chain store and they could buy a $5 t-shirt and maybe your t-shirts are $12. But that has to be resisted to match them because the people that are complaining that, you know, those are low income jobs working at those box stores are the same people that won't spend the extra $3 to support someone local or support someone that's making it here. And then they turn around and they complain that, oh, these companies are using, you know, child labor across seas. 
but you won't spend the extra $3 to actually support the industry in the direction of not using abusive labor. You're still going back and you, you like the result of that. You just don't like how it gets there, but you're not willing to change. But as an entrepreneur, as someone with, with a business that makes products, stick to your guns, stick to your value, sell it for $12. Don't try to match those guys because all you're doing is devaluing what you're bringing to the table. The fact that you're not supporting taking advantage of other people's situation by paying them less. And I, and I think that people really need to stick to that with their businesses. Stop trying to compete with the big guys that nobody likes that style of business. They're just cherry picking the low price. Stick to your guns. Offer your service. There's value to it. Your customers will be much better quality. Your revenue will be better quality. And people will want to work for you because you stick to your principles. There was a, a documentary on Netflix about this that literally uh, proved the point that you're making right now. Um, and well, if anybody hasn't me. watched it, hey, <laughs> they should have called me because I have an opinion on it. Right. <laughs> uh, if you haven't watched it yet, go watch it. It's really, really, uh, really, really enlightening. Um, but we don't understand the power that we have individually as consumers. And, and uh, the documentary is called Seaspiracy, which why didn't they go with Conspiracy? It still bothers me to this day. I bet you it was probably just social it's a bad social marketing people. company. They should right? have called you. But everybody on social media is like, "Why didn't they do that?" Anyways, so the whole premise of the uh, of the documentary was that we're um, destroying the oceans because we're overfishing them, and it's not actually. It doesn't have anything to do with what our uh, current narrative is, which is uh, plastics and you know the plastic island or the garbage island or whatever it is, and all these other things. It's actually just our consumption of fish, our unhealthy consumption of fish. And uh, what it boiled down to was there's no real way for us to do this uh, with any level of sustainability. The only way that we can stop the effects that we're having on, on this environment and potentially maybe even reverse our negative impact is to just not buy those things. And that's the power that we have as individuals is if you don't like uh, the fact that China is stealing all of our jobs or foreign workers are coming in and taking your work, then, then you have a choice. And the choice is, first of all, spend your money where it has the biggest impact, which means if you don't like unsustainable farming, provide support to sustainable farming. If you don't like that the oceans are being overfished and destroyed, then stop buying fish. And it's not just look for the little check marky thing because that's all bureaucracy. It's all a facade. Shell companies and shell companies and shell companies with a bunch of bullshit. Uh, punchline is the guys that are doing the bad things made the thing that make you feel good about doing the bad things so that you can continue to do the bad thing. But we have the power to make the right decisions and support these other things. And if you want your, uh, <clears throat> your personal situation to improve in any way, uh, you know, embarking on that journey of starting a business or, or taking that risk is actually not as big of a risk as you think it is. It's only uh, the, the only real risk is you not doing it and leaving the world without your solution. And I think that that's the problem that everybody has. Oh, I can't compete with Walmart. I can't sell my t-shirts at $6. People buy t-shirts at $6 at Walmart all the time. Yeah, but I have a brand that supports planting trees. And I'm using a real life example here. For every t-shirt that you buy from me, I'm going to plant 10 trees. This is not an advertisement anyway. <laughs> but I, I, have a, I have a brand that every time you buy a it's shirt, a 10 trees. And here's what happens is those t-shirts cost $50 but you're making an impact. You're making a difference. The choice that you make to support the thing, same, the same thing happened with, uh, with Tom's, um, you buy a pair of shoes for yourself and a second pair of shoes is going to, um, an underprivileged country where people need shoes and you're donating that, sh the, that pair of shoes to somebody else. That's why the price is $80 for a $40 pair of shoes. That company still has to be in business. It still has to support the people that work there. It still has to provide you with a product and a solution to whatever it is that you that you have, but but these socially conscious, socially um, socially aware businesses they exist now, and the more we talk about it, uh, the more 
support they get, the better of an impact they have on the world. And um, hopefully, you know, a conversation like this inspires somebody to do something. First of all, you know, if you are in the position, if you're, you know, somebody who needs to follow direction and you're, you're comfortable and safe there, then choose where you work. If yeah. you're somebody who is in the position of becoming a leader and you you decide to embark on that, then then lead with empathy and kindness and compassion and love and, and generosity to the environment around you. And that solves the problem that we're all having. But those are those are the options and you got to pick one. You got to go with it. And, and we feel helpless as individuals, but that's it. You take those steps and you regain your power to make an impact and have an impact on the world rather than, you know, just posting social media posts and virtue signaling so that your three or four friends believe that you're good, even though you're still buying, you know, those Nike shoes that were made in a sweatshop. Yeah. And I, I think the, I think people are finally realizing to an extent that they can't rely on anyone else. It doesn't mean they don't work for anyone else, but they can't rely on anyone else. And this path, you know, with, with the pandemic and how governments reacted, how industries reacted, there was some good, there was some bad, but people realized that, Hey, I, there's gotta be a way because if they turn the, if they turn the tap off on my company, I'm hooped. So how do I create a sustainable income for myself? That is not that right. That doesn't rely on that. It's true. Even people that were self-employed were, were affected. But there were some industries that flourished and not because they were taking advantage. It was just they were they were in the right spot, but because they still had control over how they were going to adapt, how they were going to change, how they were going to look at people's needs now. And they, they didn't have to answer to 100,000 shareholders and revenue. They, they could take that risk, but it was still in their control. They didn't have to sit on the couch and wait for the call that you can come back to work. And there were companies that, that did that, the financial sector, like hit records. And why? It wasn't because people had all this extra money, but a lot of it was like, okay, how do, how do I make an income now? Because my job may not come back. And people that invested in brick and mortar stores realized that maybe online is the way to go because that's sustainable. There's, there's no overhead. There's no cost. People think starting a business takes hundreds of thousands of dollars because they watch Shark Tank. The reality is you can start a business at a very low cost if you have the right service and the right plan and the right leaders and the right coaches. And that is why people don't take the risk. And no one's ever showed them that it can be very simple to work for yourself if you have the right plan in place. Yeah, and it does boil back down to the just the lack of exposure, the lack of education or the lack of um, information. Not that the, the information doesn't exist, but... Um, it's not discouraged, right? It's not readily available. It's um, diluted, even, I would say, sometimes intentionally made complicated so that you maybe think that you can't do the things that you um, think you can do. Like like print on demand, as an example. If you're, if you're a, a, a writer and you wrote something and that something you feel like the world needs to read it, you know, you can go and get a, a, an Amazon KDP account and you can self-publish your book on Amazon for free. And you can create a paperback and an ebook version for free and then share that with the world. And Amazon will print that book when somebody orders it. So if you see that book on Amazon and you're like, I want that book, you order that book. The author takes their cut. Amazon takes the $3 and 75 cents it takes to print it and amazon ships it packs it and does all the logistical work for you you no literally risk. have to don't do anything now if you want that book to be you know a million dollar box office hit you might want to put a little bit of marketing behind it you might want to share it around you might want the rest of the world to know it they're not going to know unless you let them know and and then and then you're good the same thing exists in um pretty much any other product that you ever imagined existed there's a company called printful uh, printful.com. And if you want to start a t-shirt company, you can literally take your design, put it on printful, embed it into a free Shopify store. You've paid $0 so far. And every time somebody orders a t-shirt from you, printful will create that t-shirt, package it, brand it for you, and then ship it out to your customer. They'll take their cut and you keep the difference in your bank account. It literally costed you nothing. 
Hmm. There, there's ways that you can turn your ideas into business. And it's not even limited to, um, to t-shirts. If you do art, you can take your prints and put it on canvas, same company. If you're a fitness trainer and you want to sell water bottles, you can take your little logo or your brand or whatever you created um, that you can create yourself for free and then put it on a water bottle and then put it in your store and then sell it on your TikTok and you're you're making money. And sure, it might not be a million billion dollars in your first time putting something out. But, you know, you make a hundred dollars a week and you use that to invest in a little bit of marketing because you're still getting by. You know what I mean? That hundred dollars in marketing is going to grow your brand. It's going to grow your business. It's going to gather people around in, in some sort of community around what you stand for and how you help people. And that's where the marketing comes in and the sustainable content model, being able to communicate on a regular basis. But like all of these opportunities exist across the board for everybody to take advantage of. It's just the fact that nobody even knows that it exists. Well, how do you Google something if you don't know what to Google? Yeah, you still need that fundamental understanding. Somebody and, had to tell you that it existed. And so I yeah. hope that maybe this helped somebody spark an idea so that they go and Google Printful and Amazon KDP and make something happen. Well, and I think another thing that holds people back is taxes, right? Mm. And they're like, oh, you know, the financial part of it. And you know, you're not going to be a $100,000 earner in your first six months or first tax season, unless you got something crazy, but then you're in a different level then. But the way it's set up is it's very risk-free, even from a financial standpoint. Sure, maybe you don't know all the ins and outs. Maybe you're going to miss out on a few write-offs here and there. But like you, you really don't owe anything until you make a certain amount of money. So that first is almost kind of a freebie experimental. Yeah. And all, all you have to do is just say, this is what I brought in. And then whoever does your taxes for you, whether it be h and Block or your friend who does accounting, they're just going to say, oh, okay, how much were these expenses here? I'll add them up. I'll put them in that account. And then there's your total at the end. Yeah. And owning a business, it's set up so that you don't pay taxes. Like that's just, that's, that's the way it is until you make a lot of money. And then, and then your taxes is kind of another bracket, but you're trained by them. So the system well, is trained up to help you. Yeah. And, in, and depending on where you decide to build that business, there's incentives. So I know, you know, certain governments in certain places, whether that be in Canada, United States, Europe, India, wherever, uh, certain governments give you specific tax, tax breaks for starting businesses because they want you to create jobs. They want you as a, as a leader to uh, lead people to some level of success. And if that means, you know, hiring somebody to take care of this part of your business, that part of your business, that part of your business, then you're doing exactly what you're meant to do. And the government gives you incentive to make that happen through uh, the the tax breaks and the other, you know, the, the grants and loans and all kinds of uh, really amazing opportunities. All it takes is for you to have that little bit of exposure to know, oh, well, that actually exists. Maybe I should spend a couple of hours just doing some quick searches or connect with somebody on LinkedIn who that's what they specialize in. Ask them questions. People are more than willing to answer things. And and here's uh, coming from my perspective as a, as a marketer or a business person in, in this niche, if, if you came to me and started asking me questions about marketing, it's in my best interest to answer those questions for you. You know why? Because you're probably going to turn into a customer. And if you don't turn into a customer, one of your friends will, because maybe they don't want to take it on because they see how much shit you have to go through to make it work. And that's fine. But at some point in time, me being there for somebody pays off. And I think that that's crucial for people to understand when they're entering into this world. And having a right, having the right plan. I mean, yeah, it's, it can be simple, but like I said, you still need a, a good idea to have a company. Yeah. Um, but if you have that spirit, that motivation, you will find that. I watched a, an interview, one of Jeff Bezos' first interviews. And it's oh, really yeah. cool because I'm fascinated with him. You know, he, yeah. he takes a lot of flack and everyone's like, oh, you know, he's making all these trillions of dollars. Yeah, but he didn't take advantage of when COVID hit. He was established and it just took off because he was there when it happened. He didn't start it because of COVID. They asked him, what gave you the idea to start to start Amazon? And you know, back when he had hair and it's kind of grainy TV on, on the interview. And he's like, I was working for a company and the, I, I saw the statistic that online people were using online for purchasing at an exponential rate. And he just said, I asked myself, how do I, how do I tap into that? So he started selling books as, as Amazon 
And then it just kind of grew from there and, and look where we are. But he just saw something, saw an opportunity and was like, how do I tap into that? He didn't start selling a million different things. He picked a simple attainable goal and just continued to grow it. Yeah. And Bill Gates, same thing. Like I have family that's down in Seattle. And if you talk to people that have been in Seattle for, you know, 30, 40 years, they know the backstories. There's all these hidden stories that are really neat to listen to. He went knocking door to door, asking for investors, a hundred dollars. You could buy a share. You could buy shares into Microsoft. But back then a hundred dollars was a lot of money. Not yeah. everyone had it, but anyone who chipped in that hundred bucks, they're doing pretty good, you know? And, but that was the thing he saw a niche. He goes, this is going to be the big thing. Computers are going to be the future. And he jumped on it. However, he got there, whatever those rumors and stories are, are relevant. The fact is he saw an opportunity and he took it. He, he took that risk. Yes, there is always a little bit of risk in business, but what is the risk? Is it going bankrupt? No, it's that you might have to adapt. You might have to change. You might have to look for another source of revenue, but that's, that's the risk. It's, it's not, Oh, I'm going to lose everything because people who lose everything and have to sell their house and give away their kids are people that didn't know when to stop. They didn't know when to adapt. They didn't know when to change. They were so stuck on an idea that they would not let it go to everyone else's detriment. That's not the average entrepreneur. It's crazy that you're saying this. I'm thinking now of this uh, video I just saw uh, on TikTok yesterday. This girl started out on and, and she posted like one video, got like 30 views. And it was just like some just her and her friend, you know, fooling around doing nothing. And, and then one day this idea hit her and she was like, oh, you know, I'm going to go for it. So she started making fake commercials for stupid things. Uh, she made a commercial for a paperclip. She made a commercial for a fork. She made a commercial, just like, just the dumbest things that you could think of, but she like did little videos of it. And I'm telling you, man, when I watch these videos and coming from somebody who is in the video production world, they were not easy to create. So it wasn't like she was putting out videos every single day of her, you know, trying to look pretty online. She was just doing a thing that she thought was fun and interesting. The, uh, the moral of the story was she ended up uh, getting approached by some low level brands who were just starting out that wanted commercials made. And she got, got a couple of gigs and those videos that she made with a little bit of a budget, well, obviously she was able to elevate those videos to, to, to a certain degree. And those caught the attention of a major marketing firm in New York. I'm pretty sure it was New York or LA. One of the two places, major marketing firm there. They hired her on, signed a ridiculous contract. And now she's doing the thing that she loves doing. And she didn't even have to start her own business. She just had to put herself out there and, sh and show the world what she was capable of. And that's all it took for her to find the opportunity that, and this isn't the end of her story either. It's, this isn't some like, oh, that's the happy ending. She's going to go onward and upward from here. And, and you're going to see her accolades on all kinds of things. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere in the future she did a movie because she's really good at what she does. But it was the, uh, the effect of her uh, consistently putting herself out there and taking that risk of like, here's what I do. This is what I'm up to. And, and this is what I'm going to do. And <laughs> yeah, the risk wasn't financial. I no, mean, it was just her emotional well-being to, to put herself out there in some kind of way. Yeah. Cause I'm sure that she's got a lot of haters too, being like, Oh, you know, this is whatever. And what a dumb thing to do is like waste your time on a paperclip commercial. But like, look where it got her a ridiculous yeah. contract, making way more money than I think that person will ever see in their lives. Like, Cause they spend so much time investing in doubting rather than investing in the pro probability or the possibilities uh, that can come out of those opportunities. So I think that that's a huge part of it. Look at the, the, the lashback that anyone with a level of success, and I'm not talking about success, like, you know, Elon Musk or anything like that. I'm talking about just people that have a sustainable business, support their family, whatever. That's a level of success. And people are just, there's always going to be people that criticize it. Right. And, and those people will never do anything for themselves. And that's fine. That's, you just have to accept that there are people that just want to watch the world burn. And that's, that's reality. But if you let that hold you back, then you're, you're not just doing a disservice. Like you bring up to your customers, you're, you're actually holding your family back because an eight to five job somewhere else means that that's eight to five, that you're not with your kids. 
or you're not doing something that you enjoy and you're waiting for retirement. Well, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't you love to, to drive your dream car when you're 30 instead of when you're 70? Right. But that's so, not in your grasp. So much of uh, what goes on in our heads is um, what, what gets planted in there from other people. And here's the crazy part about it is the haters. This is this collective group of people that, like, as you said, want to watch the world burn. They see the world this way. This is the way the world is. And they work to ensure that that's the way the world is. And so when they see you out there trying to do your thing, they're like, no, that's not the way the world is. And so they must project that onto you. And if you're susceptible to it, you'll catch it. And, and then you're out there believing that that's also the way the world works and that these possibilities and these um, potential opportunities that are impossible. And it's only reserved for a special elite group of people. And unfortunately, that will hold you back from becoming one of those special elite kinds of people. There's no, there's no prerequisite to uh, helping people with something if you do those things and you don't allow somebody else to project their insecurities on you, you open up the door to the, to the potential of what that means for you. And as you said, for your family and for everybody else that uh, stands to benefit from your success. No, it's, I, I always encourage people like if you can work for yourself in some capacity, even part-time on the side, so you don't have to work as hard at, at your other job, there's a reward to it. You yeah. Know? But I, I, one of the things that came up today, and I'll say this kind of in conclusion for my part today, is the importance of relying on people, relying on coaching, relying on, you know, others that give you a different perspective. And that's why we call this the perspective. I, you look at somebody like Carey Price, arguably probably the world's best goaltender, or at least in the, in the top few. Carey Price has a goaltender coach. Why? Why does he have a goaltender coach? He's the best goalie in the world because it's not that his coach is the, a better goaltender than him, but it's that his coach understands what he needs to work on to be better. He understands that with your style of play, you got the defenseman and the head coach is teaching his defenseman to play this way. So you have to adapt. Here's how you have to adapt. He watches hours of video, brings that information back and says, Hey, here's where, Here's where we need to tweak a little bit. Here's where we need to adjust. Here's where you've changed. And maybe we need to take this back. He's not telling him how to be a better goalie. He's telling him how to perform better. He's the one with the talent. And so with business, you know, I watched a video today that said, oh, to be a better salesman, you know, you just got to do those things every day. And you just, you got to keep at it and you'll improve. And I'm like, yeah, but you've said nothing. You've said nothing that helps anybody other than just keep improving which they know they're asking you how. So what you need to do is find somebody that looks at your situation and says, okay, here are the top things that you need to try to do every day and put them in real application. That's how you improve, whether uh, as a salesperson, on, whether you work for somebody, whether you're self-employed, whatever your situation is, you need someone to identify because sometimes you can't see it when we look at ourselves. We think we're doing everything to the best of our ability. But all you need is just that extra little perspective. And that's the value of relying on somebody else to help grow your business with you. That's my, that's my rant for the day. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, support that anymore. It's uh, absolutely crucial that you allow yourself to be teachable and open the, the doors to those opportunities. Otherwise, you're going to stay in that little bubble that you're in. I, I think that's a, a great place to wrap this one up. Yeah. I'm, I've said my piece. Otherwise I'll just go on another tear and that'll be for another episode. <laughs> awesome. So uh, anybody that's watching or listening, uh, go check out uh, some of the resources. We got links in the descriptions. Um, and if there's any way that Mitch or myself can support you in your journey, yeah. Please, please, please comment, reach out, DM, whatever it takes, email, find us somehow, and we will be here uh, to help you along in your journey.